Seattle City Council is getting ready to change, and Amanda K. Helmick wants to be part of that change from the 1st District running for office. Amanda, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, the 1st District, what's the most important issue to your district? Most important issue to District 1 right now is growth and growth management. The uh, Urban Village Network which was created in 1994, had put a targeted growth on especially the Alaska Junction. And right now, they're about 300% over their target. And the problem with that is not that growth is a bad thing, but there has been no um, improvements in infrastructure. So the way that people get in and out of West Seattle hasn't changed. And without having some improvements there, it's not going to get better for West Seattle, it's just going to get worse. So that, that's, that's the worst thing that's going on for West Seattle right now, what our challenge is. Well, we're going to be talking an awful lot about uh, those issues, but you know what? People who might be voting for you, they need to get to know you first. Tell sure. us a little bit about who Amanda K. Helmick is. Sure. Um, I'm a mom. Uh, I'm a mom and I'm a wife. I am a volunteer. I am a bookkeeper. That's what I do for a living. I'm a project manager. You're a numbers cruncher? I'm a numbers cruncher. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm a numbers cruncher. Not a bad cruncher. thing to have in public office. No, no. I think we actually probably need a little bit more of that. Um, I've been living in West Seattle for almost eight years, and I got involved because of my son. There was an opportunity to rebuild a park near our house, and they were looking for volunteers. And uh, along with being an artist, I've done woodworking and, and those sorts of things. So I kind of have a dual brain going on where I can project manage and I can crunch numbers and I can also uh, add a little uh, flair. And they were looking for volunteers. So I contacted them and said, hey, what, what do you need? And it was a great group of people who had already started this process, and they were just looking for someone to kind of come in and trim the sails. And that's what we did. And then for five days in November, two years ago, we rebuilt a whole park with 200 people from the community. It was amazing. And that experience was so powerful for me because it was people that didn't know each other coming together to rebuild this park. And I was just completely inspired by the whole process. And then I got involved with the community through uh, the community neighborhood group mm -hmm. and kept going from there. And I just felt like this is, this is it. This is what I really want to do with my time and my life. So. Wow. Okay. Well, that's, that's good. Now, you've lived in other parts of the city as well, though, right? I have. That's correct. I settled in West Seattle. I bought a house in West Seattle. But when I first moved to West Seattle, or excuse me, to Seattle, I lived in Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to the Central District. And then I moved to Lower Queen Anne. So I lived in a few different places around town. Mm -hmm. So when I ask this question, so those of you who live in West Seattle, don't get angry at me. In fact, it's a positive thing. West Seattle's different. West Seattle is different. Why, why is that? Absolutely. West Seattle is a small town in a big city. We are separated um, by the Duwamish, and we're mm -hmm. surrounded by water. And even though we're only five miles from downtown, it seems like a long way because we have the water in between. So West Seattle definitely has a small town feel where everybody knows each other. You, you don't really go to the grocery store or Target or anywhere without running into at least one pe person that you know. So that's what makes West Seattle different. We're just a small town facing this big city. But it's also over the years been a very active group of people. Sure. I mean, active in their community, active yeah. politically, uh, and a large group of uh, single family homeowners. That's true. Which is different than a good bit of the rest of the city. Absolutely. Yeah, again, you have that separation. Whether it's, it's perceived or real, uh, there is a separation. It's almost like West Seattle's the suburb. You know, you, people move to the suburbs to raise their children. That's what I did. I lived, you know, was living downtown and renting, and then when my husband and I got married, we thought, well, where, where can we buy a house? And the place in West Seattle that we bought, it was affordable in that area, and it is affordable. So you're still close to downtown, but yet there's still some affordability there. So I think that that is what's going on with West Seattle, is that there's still this holdout of, of being close enough to the city to work there, uh, mm -hmm. enjoy the nightlife, but also being far enough to way, a way to have good schools where you raise your kids and parks and um, a sense of community and, and space. Mm -hmm. One thing I know that people in West Seattle are very concerned about is transportation. Absolutely. And uh, one of the biggest transportation difficulties uh, surrounds uh, the tunnel. Correct. Uh, the viaduct has been very useful for people for a long, a long time. Uh, the tunnel is going to have reduced um, capacity. Yes. So are the people of West Seattle uh, and your potential district, are they worried about it? Uh, 
or do they want it? I mean, you might have an opportunity to, uh, to be a person that helps decide it. I hope so. I hope I am. Uh, yes. I'll, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, I did not vote for the tunnel. I don't believe that the tunnel is a great idea. Uh, I think that the fact that you are basically bypassing downtown is not smart for people coming south. And it doesn't just affect West Seattle, it affects Burien and Tukwila, Des Moines. Uh, the areas that are farther south that used 509 and 99 to get up and through the city. I started the West Seattle Transportation Coalition. Um, back when Metro had threatened to cut the buses, there was one area of our city, uh, Arbor Heights, um, our town, West Seattle. <laughs> Again, see, there's the, there's the ownership, uh, called Arbor Heights. And mm -hmm. Arbor Heights was a place that was annexed back in the 60s. And it's a little peninsula, almost, area at the south end. And it's one of the areas that I represent as chair of the Westwood Roxville Arbor Heights Community Council. And when Metro came out with their bus cuts, most of the bus service, almost all of the bus service in Arbor Heights was going to be cut. And that was very concerning, obviously, to the people of Arbor Heights, West Seattle, myself in, included. And what we decided to do, me and my co-chair and, and other people, uh, was kind of get together with the rest of West Seattle. The idea for me was, hey, if, if we're having this conversation with Metro and it's just us down here in the south end, what if we got the rest of West Seattle together? I mean, they were going to be losing their bus service in lots of different places, so maybe we can uh, all get together and have 100,000 people saying, you know, this is not what we're going to do. So we reached out to a lot of the different community groups. Uh, we put them together and we said, we kind of have this crazy idea of, um, you know, creating a coalition where we get together and we talk about issues. And it mostly was centered, centered around the buses. Yeah. But when we got together with the people, our first meeting was in September of 2013, and there were about 60 people in the room. And you could see that people were excited about this and that there were more needs than just the bus service. There was the ingress and the egress, um, water taxi, bicycles. There were all kinds of different things that people were concerned about. So we decided to form a group. And um, I was the chair. I'm co-chair now, currently co-chair, West yeah, Seattle Transportation that's the Coalition. That's Transportation Coalition. Correct. Yeah. And this, this past year has been incredibly productive for us. We have uh, talked to um, SDOT. We've had SDOT out. We've spoken with Lynn Peterson. Lynn Peterson um, was one of our guests. Uh, we had Todd Trepier, who is the project manager for the tunnel. They're answering questions and talking to us. So Really? Yeah. So oh, uh, yeah. when's, when's uh, going to be done? So that's the, that's the kicker. That's the kicker. Uh, the biggest problem that I see is that there is no plan B. So when they created the tunnel, when they created this program, they started this program, there was no plan B. There is no plan B. Currently, mm -hmm. there's no plan B. And it's concerning to me that you would start a multi-billion dollar project knowing that this might happen, that the soil that you're going through is unstable, um, that there are going to be a lot of challenges, that there is no plan B for if there's no tunnel. Well, sure there's a plan no B. It's just add more money. Well, no, no. The plan B is uh, there's not even add any more money. There is no more money to add. The, the plan B should be what streets are we going to uh, rearrange to reroute people? How are we going to... Um, add more bus service? Can we add more ferries? One of the things that we're going to be doing to help people move around the city if there is no tunnel and there is no viaduct. That's what I'm concerned about as a citizen of West Seattle, as someone who's running for District 1. You know, the tunnel is a little bit out of our hands. You know, the people voted for it and it's a Washington State project, mm -hmm. but what I'm concerned about is the tunnel and, or excuse me, but the viaduct. And if the viaduct needs to be shut down, what what do we do? How does that, how, how, what do we do? It sounds like a great question. Um, <laughs> and I don't think there's a whole lot of answers right here. Not, As not you said, yet. There, isn't a, there isn't a plan B. There's not a plan B. Um, in listening to you, I mean, wow, you really are involved in your community, the West right. Seattle Transportation Coalition. We've already talked about the park. The Is it Westwood Roxbury Community Council? Westwood Rox Hill Arbor Heights. Oh, Westwood Rox Hill Arbor Heights. Okay, okay. so tell me, tell me about that. How, how sure. is that? From uh, Does that prepare you to be a city council member? I do think it does. Uh, you know, I think 
The Westwood Rockville Arbor Heights Community Council is set up like any other community council. We have elections, we have a chair, we have a co-chair, we have you know committees. So all of those things are are already being um, established. They're established, and mm -hmm. I got involved because we had an incident at the park where we had a couple of 13-year-old uh, children strong arm robbed by 17-year-old children and it outraged the community rightly and there was no active group in that area so what we decided to do was because Arbor Heights doesn't really have any representation we decided that Westwood, Roxville, Arbor Heights should kind of get together again it's this coalition this collaboration that the more people you have speaking together the better so I've learned a lot from that and I want to bring to City Council that same feeling of collaboration. I think it's wonderful that we have district elections because we can be collaborative. I can look at people in the fifth district and say, hey, what are your challenges up there? How can we help you? And vice versa, how can they help us? Well, but that's been, that was one of the arguments against districts, though, which was balkanization. There's, right. a, there's so much money, and you're going to be arguing for the first. That person's going to be arguing for the fifth, and so nobody's going to get along. Is that the way it's going to work? I don't think so. I don't feel that that's going to be the outcome. I, I feel it's going to be opposite. I think that especially with, uh, we have so many people running that are new, that have great ideas, and if we can get those people elected, I can see us all working together a lot better than this mine, mine, me, me attitude. I, I don't think that that's going to let the city survive to have that kind of attitude. The campaign as we speak right now is pretty young. Yes. Um, how has it been so far for you? You talked about how there are a lot of people who are running with, with new ideas, new people running new ideas. It's a great thing. I yeah. think we all, we all like that. But are we losing a lot in the experience that there is on council? Maybe. Maybe. Um, that's a good point. I think that we have a lot of experience in council. We also have had people who have been there for a long time with no new real ideas. You know, the 10-year the, um, plan to end homelessness is a good example. You know, here we are in its 10th year, and they just did a night count, and we're up 20% in homelessness. So we haven't really solved that problem. So. I think while the experience factor um, of people who've been there for a long time is, mm -hmm. is valuable, mm -hmm. the, uh, I, the real idea here is that we have new people coming with new ideas. We have a lot of really smart people in this town, incredibly smart people mm -hmm. who care a lot about this city, and we need to hear from them. One of the very first things that you talked about was how West Seattle has grown much faster than what the expectations Correct. were. Yeah. Uh, how can you manage growth? How can the city manage <coughs> growth and serve the people? Yeah. Should you just say, okay, nobody else can move in here and just, just uh, put oh. a lock on the gate? No, my goodness, never, never. We never want to do that. That is definitely not something that we'd want to do. You know, it's a funny thing. Seattle is such a wonderful place, and a lot of people are moving here. They're seeing the value of Seattle, the mountains and the, the green, and how we're very progressive here in Washington State, and Seattle mm -hmm. in particular. And it, it's not going to stop people from moving here, and it's definitely not going to stop businesses from moving here. And I think that the way that we manage growth is by creating more density in certain areas, but not necessarily density for just single people who have jobs at Amazon. We need to be thinking about you know, two bedrooms and three bedroom towers, apartment towers or condo towers, where people can live with their families as well, where you have a, a sense of community even within these structures. You know, we have schools and green spaces, places for people to gather. And I think that's how we manage the growth, is we get away from this idea that we need to make housing just for single people who are, you know, going to work and then coming home and then eating out all night. We need to be thinking more holistically about who we're going to be serving in the future. Just want to remind everyone, we're talking with Amanda K. Helmick, who is a candidate for uh, Seattle City Council District 1, which represents uh, the West Seattle area. Uh, her website is up on the screen. If you have questions, go to the website. Um, managing growth also, and, and you being a numbers cruncher, uh, when you put it all together, the $15 an hour that is gradual, you know, wage that is yeah. gradually coming into the, the city of Seattle, is that a good thing, bad thing? Um, is it something that can be managed? What's going to happen? 
A $15 an hour minimum wage or a fair wage, a fair living wage is crucial to this city. It's crucial to the people who work in this city and it's not just crucial to the people who are making that wage, it's crucial to the people who also want to live here and keep this area diverse. Keep this city, what we love about this city, that we have cultures from all around the world. We have languages spoken all around the world. So yes, mm -hmm. a fair living wage is, is something that I support. Whether it's $15 or $18, I don't know what that is, but right now let's work with what we have. Being a numbers cruncher, though, and, um, can small businesses make it with, with that wage? Well, you know, I think they can. I, I work for small businesses, mm -hmm. and uh, I have friends that own small businesses. My husband owns, he's a sole proprietor. And, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's going to be a little bit different, but it's not un... Uh, there's no, the way that they're doing it is they're gradually put, putting it in. It's not like they're just going to pay people $15 mm -hmm. an hour tomorrow. The average wage in Seattle is about $11.50. So already you're at eleven fifty. So you're not, the, that is not going to affect it too much as it grows up year after year after year. I'm willing to pay more money for a hamburger. I'm more willing to pay an extra dollar for whatever that service is if the person who's helping me can live close, can have reliable transportation and raise their children in the city. Yeah. Um, the neighborhoods of West Seattle, it's not, West Seattle is not just one no. neighborhood, is no, it? No, definitely well, What not. are some of the neighborhoods? Well, we can start at the north. We have the Admiral District. Um, mm -hmm. We have Gatewood. Uh, we can start in the Southwest District. So there's two different districts. There's the Delridge District, which is on the east side of 35th, and we have Southwest, which is on the west side of 35th. And um, Delridge encompasses, uh, you have the Puget Ridge neighborhood, you have Pigeon Point, you have Highland Park, you have Westwood and Rockville on that side. Um, you have Arbor Heights on the south, and then you have um, Fauntleroy. The Fauntleroy Community Association has been around for a long time. There's the Morgan Junction. Mm -hmm. And then there's little tiny, you know, hills in between that people also have their ownership of. So what are the similarities of the various uh, neighborhoods and then what are the differences? Southwest District uh, historically is um, on the west side has m more uh, wealth. There's more wealth on that side. Mm -hmm. uh, Delridge was a redlined area uh, which means that it was uh, it was harder to get a mortgage on that side mm -hmm. uh, so you have a lot more immigrants on that side of the, the line. Um, but ultimately, the similarity is that we all love West Seattle. There's, there's a love of West Seattle. You know, the West Seattle blog is something that people go to first for news. You know, I heard sirens. Oh, yeah, that's an amazing blog. Yeah, Absolutely yeah, and, and everybody in West Seattle reads it. it hmm. it's, it's a community puller. It pulls everyone together. Um, everyone has kids there. A lot of people have kids there. People have dogs. You, know, you see people walking their dogs. So ultimately, what brings us together is this need to um, be safe, you know, raise our kids in a place that they'll be safe. That's what brings us together. You know, you've talked a little bit about, about families versus, not necessarily versus, but uh, families should be considered in growth uh, at the same time that we are also talking about the, the single person who, Absolutely. Who, who has a different lifestyle. Absolutely. Interestingly, in the Seattle Times just recently, there was a, an article that said that Seattle is going against the grain and against the, the common wisdom, if you will, that more families are indeed moving into Seattle and more people are having families in Seattle. Right. Why is that? Seattle's a wonderful place. It, it's a wonderful place to be. I love Seattle and I love that my son is being raised here. Our attitude of um, being, caring for the environment you know, we care so much about the environment, our carbon footprint, uh, how much we drive our cars, what kind of cars we drive, um, our schools and how involved people are with their schools, our parks. We have coalitions of people who, who are trying to save green spaces. These are values that are, are progressive values that the country um, needs to learn from, needs can take from, can, go, can look at Seattle to be a leader as far as, you know, we accept people for who they are here. Mm -hmm. And raising your family here is, is, it's why you would raise a family here. You said that um, 
a big inspiration for you running was the the community based solutions yes. that that you you had in, in something with regard to the park. Right. Um, do we not have that here now? No, I, I don't believe that we do. Uh, the Do you know the City Neighborhood Council? Do you know what that is? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. When I ask that question to most people, they say, no, I've never heard of that before. And that's concerning to me because the structure of how we are supposed to engage with our government is set through that, through the resolution 20, um, 27709, which establishes uh, what is now the Department of Neighborhoods, mm -hmm. um, and underneath that, the City Neighborhood Council, which I'll just explain it a little bit. Uh, the City Neighborhood Council is the body that has the 13 representatives from the districts around the city. And then that group represents the neighborhood councils. So like Westwood, Roxville, Arbor Heights, we would go to, we go to the Del Ridge Neighborhoods District Council. And I'm actually the, the uh, representative to the CNC for Del Ridge. And that's how you engage with your government. So wait a minute, you, you Del Ridge, Westwood, uh, Roxville, <laughs> Uh, the transportation I council. Went down, Is there I anything went you don't down, do? No, I kind of <laughs> went down the rabbit hole here because <laughs> I found again that the value. Um, I'm an action person. I, okay. I I like to take action, and um, I found there's a lot of value in meeting with other people from around the city. You know, speaking with people in the downtown district, speaking with people in Ballard, um, in Ravenna, you know, in Magnolia. You find that there's so many similarities between your challenges and your successes. And to be able to share that and say, hey, this is what's going on down in, in Arbor Heights. We're missing mm -hmm. our bus service. I know you guys are doing that as well. How are you handling that? Is very, very valuable. Um, I interrupted you though before and I apologize okay. about that, but we were, you were talking about the, the neighborhood coalition. Right, right. Uh, so is there a place for the neighborhood coalitions in government? Oh, I hope so. Yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, we are a democracy. We are represented. Our, our, we vote people to represent our values and, and the things that we stand for. And that's basically what a city council member should be. The city council member, in my view, is the chair of their community. It's, it's that position of, you know, you are representing, all for me, all of West Seattle and South Park. And what that means to me is that there are other neighborhood groups and other people doing great work, and they need to be able to communicate with me what they need. And that has been missing. Uh, you are required under the, uh, the new law to have an office inside your district. Where will your office be? I don't know yet. That's, that's a good question. I don't know. I'd like to have roving offices, you know, open up my living room for a while maybe. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. That's good. I, I don't know where that would be. That's a, I don't know. I'll have to think about that. <laughs> right. um, in overall general, what do you think is the biggest issue that the city faces, not just uh, District 1, but the entire city? What do you think that is? Oh, you know, I think I think it's sort of uh, West Seattle's a microcosm of what's happening in in the greater Seattle area. This affordability, you know, how do we continue to grow as a city and pull people in, but yet make it affordable for them to live here? Well, that's a great question, though, because yeah. uh, because at the same point in time, you want everybody to prosper. But right. if everybody prosper, then that takes the cost of living up. Right. It's, it's a tricky uh, situation, really. And, you know, the one thing that it concerns me is that we've, there's a story, speaking in the Seattle Times, uh, that in West Seattle, uh, an apartment building was, was bought. And it was bought, I think, for one and a half million dollars. Mm -hmm. And in order for the uh, new owners to afford their mortgage, they have to raise the rent. And they were raising the rent $700 a month on their tenants. Wow. I mean $700 a month. So you for one month you're paying $900 a month in rent and then the next month it's going to go up $700. Well how where are you going to get that money from? Even if you have a good job, you're still living on a budget. I mean, you know, how many people in this town can just have a $700 increase and go, "Ah, no big deal." Well, there are some. There are some. But in your district, uh, I think it's probably... But they're not renting. Yeah, uh, yeah they're not renting. <laughs> they're That's not hard. renting. They're yeah. not facing those same challenges. And so it's hard. It's hard to remember being a renter. It's hard to remember what it was like living on a fixed budget and having these increases. So that, to me, is a real big concern that we have... Um, 
had this situation where you're paying millions and millions of dollars for these properties and then you have to raise the rent or charge exorbitant amounts of rent in order to turn a profit? I'm not really sure what the situation is there. So Well, but at the same point in time, I mean, how can we stop that? Do we go to rent controls like uh, what they have in New York City? I don't know if we should have rent control. Uh, maybe, maybe partial rent control. Maybe that's one thing that we do, but that's not the only thing we should do. I think the city should also look into, I know Shama Sawant had been looking into affordable housing bonds and using surplus city properties to build affordable housing so that people can still live in the neighborhood that they work in or that their friends are in or their kids go to school and yet still have an affordable place to live. I think there's a couple of different, those, those two options in particular we should explore. And so how do we mix these interests? You've got uh, this group here, let, let's say that they are in a very wealthy area of West Seattle and then right down the street you, know, you are building a housing project and so if I'm in a wealthy district I'm looking at that and I'm saying you've just devalued my property. Well, you can look at it that way, um, or you can look at it, wow, we just raised these people up. Okay. That's definitely a way. We've only got about a minute and a half to go, okay. so I have to ask you this. What are your expectations if, when you get on City Council? My expectations are that we take some action, that we make some decisions, and that we actually follow through with them. We've spent a lot of time auditing, processing, looking at things from all angles, and then by the time we're ready to make any kind of action, well, that data is six, seven years old. So what I'd like to see is taking some action. Yes, there is a city council member who is not running for election this time. I think people call him the Prince of Process and he won't be there anymore. So action is the thing, all right? Action is the thing. So you have just finished, let's say this, you're several years from now, you have just finished your first term. What do you think you accomplished? I accomplished better connections for West Seattle and South Park. I've accomplished a sense of um, community through the city and that the people are better off than they were four years ago. Excellent. Amanda, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you so much. We've been talking with Amanda K. Helmick, who is a candidate for Seattle City Council, the first district which encompasses West Seattle and all the areas around it. So be sure to go to the website to learn more. We'll see you next time right here. Take care. <music>